Hey YouTube, I'm Tech Steve and welcome back to my channel. I just want to let you guys know that I will start putting out new videos, but I was doing some things on the back end because we all have a life outside of the cameras. So I got everything all set up and you will start seeing a lot more videos from me. And be sure to leave a comment, a question, or anything you like if you want to see different type of content on this channel. I'll see what I can do to get to it. But back to this video, I have decided that I'm going to return these Sony's cameras and this video is going to tell you what happened when I tried to switch from my Panasonic GH5s over to the Sony cameras. So not saying anything about Sony, there's a lot of great things about them and a lot of content creators use Sony cameras, but the workflow and things that you don't see is the things I'm gonna discuss on this video. So sit back and relax and let's get into it. <music> Before I get started, I just want you guys to know that everything I'm about to say on this video are things that I came up with and things that really affected me making my buying decision of keeping these cameras or returning them. So if you already have Sony cameras and you're getting good footage out of and you really enjoy it, I think you should just turn off this video and move on to the next one. But if you're interested in seeing what the problems I had and some of the things on the back end, then that's what this video is all about. I'm gonna break this down to five areas that I find to be the best attributes of a camera. We're gonna talk about design, connections, menu system, external monitors, and codecs for video recording. So what I'm about to do is I'm gonna switch over to the overhead camera, but I'm gonna take this one off the mount so I can show you guys some of the things I'm referring to. The current setup that I'm recording on is a GH5 with the 25 to 35 millimeter lens and also have the audio adapter so you can put XLR inputs to get a clear audio system. And I'm using this microphone right here. So I'm not gonna go over every single point about this nor show you video footage on this. It's all about the logistics that I was dealing with. Here we have the a7 III and really it's a pretty good design except for this screen right here. So immediately if you buy this, you probably have to get an external screen if you're gonna do any kind of video work or vlogging because you can't see yourself. So now you gotta add additional screen on top as well as additional money and a HDMI cable. Design overall is pretty nice besides the screen, but on top you have your memory one and two, which a lot of people use for 4K, as well as your slow motion by programming to memory one and two. You have your off and on, you have a couple of customizing buttons. You can change your different settings there. On the back you get another customized key, a menu button, a record button, as well as a joystick, and you have this rotary dial right here that you can go through all the different settings with. The A7 III also has a memory card slot right there where you can add two different memory cards, which are great. And on the other side, you have these rubberized pieces that you can flip off to get to all the different outputs and inputs. And after taking out the doors, I realized immediately all these little plastic pieces were in my way. You have your USB, you have your USB 3, as well as your HDMI headphone output and your microphone input. Next we have the 6400, which is much better on the screen. As you can see, you can see yourself in there, but there's a little slot here. If you pull that off and put a microphone on there, now it's in the way of your screen. So now you have to go buy some different adapters. On the top, you still have your dial as well as a customizable dial, your off and on, one custom memory button. And they do have this eyepiece that you can slide on right there, but it's not installed. You have your flash button, menu button, autofocus right there, a few function buttons, as well as your play and trash can. On the other side, you do have a door that you can open up. And again, you have a HDMI output as well as a charger input and a microphone input, but it does not have a headphone jack. And for the memory card, you have to open up the battery case and there's a slot right there. And when it comes to GH5, you have this door that you can flip different directions so you can see yourself, especially for bloggers. And if you don't add an external monitor, Again, you'll be able to see the footage so you can make sure you're in focus and things like that. On top of the GH5, you have many more controls. You have your shutter button, you have a rotary dial. You can also adjust your white balance, ISO, shutter speed. You have one memory button and the camera record button. The cool thing about this dial is you can put the camera in different modes and you can make presets up to three of them. You're off and on, which is very easy. And all the features over here is really designed for your camera so you can take up to 6K photos as well as set a timer all from the top of the camera. On the back of it, you have your play button, another memory button, your viewfinder, a joystick, and this little piece comes in handy whenever you wanna move from manual to automatic focus, another rotary dial, display, 
couple of extra memory buttons, as well as a rotary dial here. And here's some parts I really like. You have your microphone input, as well as headphone output, a full HDMI output, and you have a USB 3 connection for fast transfers. And on this side, you have a remote output, so you can set up with sliders as well as flashes. And if you open this up, there's a slot in there for two memory cards as well. For the rest of this video, I'm just going to use the A7 III and the GH5. Now when it comes to connections, I'm so used to the GH5 having heavy duty connections, these just seem a little flimsy to me. Let me put them all in there and give you an example of what I'm talking about. You have your headphones, your mini HDMI cable, your micro USB, and I have this self-powered Rode microphone. And this is what it looks like when it's all put together, but you can see there, these flimsy connections really made it hard for me to make video footage because I didn't know sometimes if it's recording and also sometimes the screen went out, depends on if I was using a slider or not. Then I add this microphone onto it by sliding out this tray and sliding it up on the top here. And that kind of gives you an idea of what it looks like. Also on the Panasonic, you have a code chute on here in case you want to add a wireless microphone. You don't have to use adapters to be able to hold it up. Now it doesn't come with an external battery charger because those are separate. The battery you can plug in easily and then you'll use the USB on the side of it and charge it while it's inside of the camera. And since my camera is going to be more in a permanent fix, I bought these adapters for it so you can slide these in there and then you can power it up off the AC cord and you don't have to worry about the battery running out all the time. And when it comes to Panasonic, the same scenario. I like the fact that these doors don't flip all the way open. They're really nice and clean. You can plug in your USB, your HDMI, and microphone. So in my opinion, there's much clean setup. And also these connectors are a lot more heavy duty as far as that goes. This is what it looks like when you put the microphone adapter on top. Another thing about the Panasonic GH5, it comes with a external battery charger. And I've been able to acquire extra batteries just in case I want to take it mobile then I have plenty of battery and plenty of storage. And I have two of the same cameras, so I can interchange them any way I want, including the microphone. So let's talk about the Sony's menu system. First of all, you want to touch things, but you can't. It doesn't respond to anything except for the 6400. So if you want to get to some of your settings, you can hit the function button. And then you can use this to kind of get around the different settings, which wasn't too bad at first. But then I realized you have to physically use the menu button to get back on certain things. So like that, for example. Then when I went into the menu system, I noticed there are all these tabs at the top. This first tab has 14 different functions. The second one has nine. The third one has two more. Your playback has three. Your settings has seven. And then you can add some custom menu settings right there. And you feel like you want to touch the screen, but you can't. So you find yourself holding the menu button and the function button together just to go like this. So for me, I really just didn't like the menu system. It's just too complicated and all over the place. So let me show you the Panasonic so you can get an idea of what I'm talking about. But first of all, since it is a touch screen, you can use your function buttons like this to get to some of your different settings, which is kind of cool in my opinion. And then to get to the menu, you can use it one hand by pressing menu. And you have this back button right here, so. And the, to me, the menu is laid out a lot easier. So you have tabs on the side and then you can just scroll through what you want. And then if you get stuck, the back button's right here on the bottom, just like a cell phone, really easy. So in my opinion, the Panasonic was just so much easier to get through all the different settings where the Sony, I had to constantly go through different menus and it was really becoming a pain to get around that menu system. So that's another reason I like the Panasonic much, much better is the menu system is easy to navigate. Plus again, you have this function up here to get to just about everything you need. Now I'm going to show you the things I didn't like about the external monitors. So if you can see, there's a screen right here, no problem. I'm going to go ahead and plug in the HDMI cable and there we have, we have the screen here and we have the screen here. Now, if you notice, there's a lot of information on this screen, but this one is pretty blank. Now I'm going to hit the record button and see what happens. 
you notice this screen is still there, but this one would blank. So at this point, I can't see my audio settings or anything because everything's right here. So that's another thing that I don't like about this camera or the 6400. And I'm using this adapter to make it work, but every once in a while it was going sideways a little bit and the screen was shut off. So I couldn't really see anything except for my picture there. I didn't know if it was recording. I just really didn't know what's going on on the camera. Now let's take a look at the Panasonic GH5 and see what happens. One thing I like is that I can touch where I want to focus. So that's a handy thing of the touch screens besides getting through the menu system. Now let's plug the monitor in. And keep in mind that's a full HDMI cable. Now you can see on the Panasonic, it actually duplicates the same screen you see here. So I can see my record settings, my aperture, all the different settings that you would see on the camera. Now, if I hit the record button, as you can see, it's recording and it's still displaying both monitors. So that's a great plus there. It doesn't, it allows you to see everything while you're recording so you can get the best shot possible. The last thing I wanna talk about is codecs. Now the codex is really the type of file you're gonna film, like Apple use move files, some use MP4, some use AVI. So let me show you some of the things that I didn't like about the Sony in this case. Also, you only have one menu to choose from your camera settings as you can see right now on the screen. Another thing that I found a little more complicated on the Sony is that the photo functions are blended in with the video functions. So let me give you an example. Here's the main menu. And you can choose from raw, compressed or not compressed, which is good. You can also choose your JPEG you can see different sizes there. You can do the aspect ratio. And here you can use APC, which is a smaller sensor or super 35, which uses the 6K sensor inside of this. The only downside of it is that you can only record 24 frames a second when doing that. So if you go back up to the top and go to the photo two, the option you have for format would be XAVC 4K HD for 1080p and AVCHD. And under 4K, you have 24 frames a second, all the way down to 30 frames a second. But there's no other choices. You have to choose whatever codec that they built in. And if you want to do 60 frames a second, you got to go back down to the SHD, and then you can choose your slow motion, 30 frames a second, and all these different menus. So that's all the codecs you get. As far as audio, you can turn the audio recordings off or on. You have your level button. And then you can choose if you want it on the display or not. So those are the options you get for the Sony that I can find. Now let's take a look at the Panasonic. The first thing I'll show you is I just chose a random photo mode, but let's go into menus and see what options that you have. The first thing I want to point out is that there's a photo icon that shows you all the different settings that you can do just for taking pictures, which is pretty cool if you ask me. In addition to that, you have this switch right here, again, that you can change to different settings according to what you're doing. As you turn this, it actually updates the menu according to what you're looking at. And then if I put the camera back in movie mode, you can see the photo button's gone and it replaced it with the camera button. And now I can change all these different styles just for video only. And the cool thing about the Panasonic is you can choose a record format. You have the same settings you get on Sony, MP4. You can also do HDR. MP4, as well as movie mode, which Apple uses. So each of these has their own levels of quality, including 10-bit, 8-bit, just so many different options. So you can really customize this so much more under all those different settings. And when it comes to the microphone, you have your display off and on. You can adjust your levels. You can also limit how much audio is coming in it so you don't overdrive it. You have wind cancellation. And when you add the microphone adapter on it, you can also record from 44 kilohertz all the way up to 92 kilohertz at 24 bit. So you can get a better audio sound out of this camera because of that particular settings. And you can also add this particular upgrade, which I purchased, which is $100 more. And it allows you to have vlogs so you can do more professional shots as far as uh, outside and doing wedding events and things like that. If you look here, I have the vlog installed just in case you want to do more of that professional type film grading that you can get the most colors out of this camera. So for the most part, those are the things that's been bothering me. I hope you guys can see the difference between the benefits you get with the Panasonic over the Sony. 
Now, let me talk about a few more things. First of all, if you get the 6400, the great thing about this one is that it can record 4K unlimited up to the size of the memory and the battery life. So you don't have any kind of cutoff. Where the A7 III, you get about 25 minutes and then it starts getting too hot, even at 24 frames a second. So then it shuts off your video. You need to go back and check it, turn it off, turn it back on, and then you can start recording again. So that's something I really wasn't expecting to bother me. But again, you have to make smaller clips if you plan on recording in 4K. But overall, here's the things I do like about the Sony's. The focusing system is out of control. It really locks in and just about everything that you pointed at, it will focus perfectly. Another thing I like about the Sony cameras is that the colors are amazing. So if you're planning on using it for video photography, I think you'll find these cameras to produce a lot of good results as far as what you film. But again, for me, the logistics of everything I had to do, trying to move from my Panasonic to the Sony didn't work for me. Now I want you guys to know I'm not a fanboy or anything like that. Now hopefully that I backed up the facts that I'm talking about with the footage that I showed you. And if you own a Panasonic or Sony, I'd like to see you guys comment. So below this video, tell me what you guys think. Tell me all the goods that I'm missing. Tell me all the things that you're frustrated with because I would really like to know. But in the meantime, thanks a lot for watching. I'll see you guys on the next video. Peace.